The Stafford Voice. Profiles in History. In 1774, the first Continental Congress convened, and he was one of the delegates from Rhode Island. And at the age of 68, he was senior to every delegate there, and was the only one of the 55 who attended the Albany Congress 20 years earlier. Stephen Hopkins was born on March 7, 1707 in Providence, Rhode Island. He had a basic education and loved to read. He excelled in the sciences, mathematics, and literature. His proficiency in math opened the way to becoming a surveyor, and he even dabbled a bit as an astronomer. On October 29, 1726, he married Sarah Scott, and together they would have seven children. Only five lived to maturity, however, and together they started their lives on a 160-acre farm in Skituate, or Skituate, Rhode Island. Before long, his career in public service would take off. As a matter of fact, he was such a busy guy, we have to list this out in sort of a timeline fashion. So we'll start at the age of 23 in 1730 when he became Justice of the Peace for the newly formed town of Skituate that they called home. And he held this office until 1735. In 1731, he became a clerk. He became clerk of Skituate, where he would hold um, that he would hold for 11 years before moving to Providence. From 1736 to 1746, he was justice of the Inferior Court of Common Pleas and General Sessions, and for the last five years, he also sat as a clerk of the body as well. If that wasn't enough. During this same time, he was president of the town council, speaker of the House of Deputies, and was elected as a deputy in 1744, a position he held for seven years. At some point during all of that service in 1742, Hopkins sold the farm. They moved to Providence where he would be able to put more time and effort on um, business interests, namely the merchant marine business and he got into manufacturing. He got into manufacturing when he became a partner with the four Brown brothers at the time in establishing the Hope Furnace. The, this enterprise was concerned with ironworks which made pig iron and cannons for use during the Revolutionary War. Now, after it was established, his son Rufus managed the business for four decades. His wife Sarah died in 1753. The following year, Stephen was a delegate to the Albany Convention, where Benjamin Franklin proposed a plan to unite the colonies. In 1755, he married his second wife, Anne Smith. They didn't, however, have any children together. Also in the same year, Hopkins was elected to his first term as governor of Rhode Island. He lost to William Green in 1757, but Green died in office one year later, and Hopkins once again became governor. In 1762, he lost to Samuel Ward. Over the next f and over the next few years, he and Ward would go back and forth as governor. And this brings us to the year 1765, when both houses of Parliament in England passed the Stamp Act, which Hopkins opposed, something he expressed a year earlier in November of 1764, when he published a pamphlet called the Rights of Colonies Explained. Now, this pamphlet attacked both the Stamp Act and Sugar Act, arguing that direct taxation of a non-consenting people was tyrannical. Now, to get a better idea of just what this pamphlet would become, the text begins with the phrase, quote, Liberty is the greatest blessing that men enjoy, and slavery the heaviest curse that the human nature is capable of. This being so, makes it a matter of the utmost importance to men, which of the two shall be their portion. Now, this paper established Hopkins as one of the leaders of the public opinion in the colonies. Now, for Rhode Island, he became what Samuel Adams was to Massachusetts and what Thomas Jefferson was to Virginia. Now, true, Hopkins owned slaves, but his opinion changed the same year he wrote and published that pamphlet. Remember how he got into the merchant marine business? That endeavor was with his brother, Essek. 
Essek was captain of the slave ship named Sully, Sally. And the Sally left Africa with 196 slaves on board. Through sickness, suicides, and even a violent attempt to take over the ship, 109 of those Africans died on the journey. Having been so intimate with this business transaction per se, what Essek witnessed helped influence Hopkins' change of heart toward slavery. He even freed his own slaves in 1773. Now, by the time Stephen Hopkins was chosen as a delegate of Rhode Island for the First Continental Congress in 1774, he was 67 years old, the only one older than was Franklin. And maybe it was all of his life's experience that gave him the wisdom to see the heart of the conflict with Britain. He told Congress, quote, Powder and ball will decide this question. The gun and bayonet alone will finish the contest in which we are engaged. And any of you who cannot bring your minds to this mode of adjusting this question had better retire in time. On May 4th, 1776, Rhode Island had severed its ties with, to King George, and exactly two months later, on July 4th, 1776, as a delegate for Rhode Island, Stephen Hopkins voted for independence. When it was time to sign the Declaration of Independence in August, Hopkins' hand shook so bad from a palsy that he had developed in his hands, he had to hold his right wrist with his left hand to write. He commented as he signed his signature, My hand trembles, but my heart does not. Hopkins retired from public life in 1780 and lived to see the revolution's success. However, after an extended illness on July 13, 1785, he passed away in Providence at the age of 78. And that is this week's Profiles in History. <laughs>